Um, you've heard these all week. Uh, please silence your cell phones. Uh, also, I'm gonna throw one in there. If you got an iPad, don't, don't just hold it up taking pictures of the slides, it's really distracting. But uh, for evaluations, you guys will receive an email uh, after the session. Please uh, fill those out. I'll read them, GDC will read them. They really help us out. Uh, on top of that, after this, and I'll say this at the end, I'll be in the wrap-up room to answer any questions. I'm probably gonna be really tight on time, so I won't be up here answering questions. Um, other than that, I uh, hope you guys enjoy. Thanks for showing out on a Friday morning. I'm Richard Carrillo, I'm a game director at Ubisoft Toronto, um, and welcome to Interviewing for Game Design. My goal in doing this talk wasn't to stand here and say, hey, I'm an amazing interviewer, you guys should do what I do, um, although if you feel that way at the end, it's totally fine. Uh, my goal was to solve a problem that I noticed at my studio and I expect may exist at many others. So I've been at Ubisoft Toronto for over five years interviewing candidates as we grew from 150 to over 500 people. And in that time, I've interviewed candidates that are in no way game designers, all the way to people who are industry experts. And five years later, I still go into interviews and end up talking to candidates that are not game designers. But the problem was that other interviewers in our studio, other game directors, other senior designers, had given them a thumbs up. And instantly I thought, okay, what's the, how do we solve this? What questions are you asking that lead you to such a positive assessment? What questions am I asking that lead me to such a negative assessment? And how can we resolve that? So this is more of an interview post-mortem as I deep dive into the processes we've gone through at our studio. And I hope that other studios can use this to better their own hiring practices. And even candidates can use this to understand what's gonna happen in the interview process and also what to expect from the job. So when I noticed this problem, um, my first instinct of course was to talk to the other interviewers, figure out what questions they're asking, figure out what answers they're expecting, and then also to kind of watch them interview um, and see what's going on. Um, and I noticed a lot of the standard go-tos that you'd expect. First off, a deep dive into experience. So obviously the interviewer pulls out the resume, asks them to do a quick rundown, and then starts probing at interesting points uh, along the way. And this can lead to what I call the resume trap. Um, that candidate has put everything they can talk about on that resume. And you're probably gonna spend a majority of your time trying to see if they actually did what they said they did. Um, but even after that, if you determine that they have experience, it still doesn't say whether or not they're a good game designer, just that they have experience. Also, I noticed a lot of questions about process and documentation. I never really understood process questions. Um, the answers generally are these, in a perfect world, this is what I believe my process is. And most answers to process questions start to sound the same from candidate to candidate. So it doesn't really do a good job at separating candidates. And game ideas. A lot of interviewers will ask questions about, hey, can you pitch an idea for a game you really like? Can you pitch an idea for our game um, that you're interviewing for? Um, and Everyone has ideas, and I'll say this throughout the presentation, game designers do not come up with game ideas. That's not our job. Our job is to pick all the different ideas we reference from other games, we reference from the team, put those ideas into systems, and make sure we're building something that actually works. Um, so when you ask about game ideas and ask someone to pitch game ideas in an interview, um, you're not really determining if they're a game designer or a game enthusiast. And of course, again, everyone has ideas. And finally, uh, this is a major one. Uh, you end up spending a lot of time testing interviewing skills instead of testing job skills. Uh, a lot of interview questions are those open, broad questions where even if you ask as the candidate, uh, what, what, are you, sorry, what are you looking for? Um, they'll respond with, oh no, I just wanna see where you're gonna take it. Uh, these are horrible questions that end up really just testing if the candidate understands what you're looking for um, and can control the conversation. But there's a lot of great game designers that aren't good at interviewing. There's a lot of bad game designers that are great at interviewing and can BS their way through that process. So I noticed a lot of these things going on in the interview, the majority of the interview were these questions. Um, and it, they all dance around one main question, but they never really ask it. And that main question is, are you a game designer? This is probably the most important question, and this is what you want to get out of that interview. Um, because again, they can have experience, they can have a process, and they can have ideas. None of that makes them a good game designer. So how do you ask this question? And this became kind of the main thing I started focusing on in trying to resolve this problem. First, you have to understand what game design is and define it for your studio. And this is my definition. Uh, it may be different from studio to studio as some studios may be more technical with their game designers. Some studios may actually have level design with their game design. Um, but for this is for our studio. Um, so game designers design systems. We are not idea generators and I kind of said this already. A system is a series of mechanics and mechanics are a series of ideas. So that's why when you go to your game designer and you say, hey, I got a cool idea, wouldn't it be cool if, and the game designer looks at you like you're crazy, it's not because it's not a cool idea, it's because they're stepping through it and going, okay, how does that idea change the mechanic? How does that alter the system? How does that affect the game? And that's the mental process for game design. That's what they own. 
And that's not something everyone can do. But again, everyone has game ideas. There's nothing special about that. We're also problem solvers. We aren't design critiquers. Um, to solve a problem, you have to understand the system, you have to identify the problem, and then of course you have to propose solutions. To critique design, you just have to not like something. I don't like chairs with poor lumbar support. That doesn't make me good at designing chairs. And finally, uh, we're big on owning the player experience, but we're not level designers. And the difference there is level design focuses on player experience, but they focus on building engaging spaces and, and good flow through those spaces, while game designers will focus on building engaging gameplay loops that keep the player hooked and keep the player invested in the experience overall. So this is my definition of game design. Um, again, it may be different from studio to studio, but the first step for me was to define it, and then on top of that, now as an interviewer, I want to ask questions that lead me to answers that are on the green side, and then I want to stay away from questions that generally trend toward answers on the red side. Because again, I don't want idea generation, I don't want people design critiquing. So let's step through kind of each of these sections, starting out with basic systems. And I want to give you guys kind of a bad question and a good question that I've seen in this process, um, so you can get a better understanding of the issues we had at our studio. Uh, so first bad question, and you may hate me because you may ask these questions. What's your favorite game and what would you change in that game? There's a lot of variance to this question, but my main issue with it is, it really is just saying, I want you to talk until I hear something interesting. And then if you say something interesting, maybe I'll join the conversation and maybe we'll go deeper into systems. But what you really want from this answer is for them to deep dive into a system in a game they like, pick it apart, figure out some problems that were with it, and then bring up some solutions that might fix those problems. But this isn't what this question's asking. What you're actually going to get from this question a lot of the time is, oh, I like this game, but I wish it had more characters. That has nothing to do with game design, but it's a valid answer because you asked them sort of an opinionated open question. So breaking this question down a little further, again, it's not about systems or game loops. For the, the candidate to be able to answer that way, that's just them understanding that that's what you want and then controlling that conversation, which is good for them, but you may be missing out on great game designers that aren't good at that. And again, it's all about idea generation and design critiquing. It's just too open, and an easy way to figure out if your questions are too open is take 10 minutes, sit down, write down all the good and bad answers to that question, and if you can't do it because it's just inf there's infinite answers, it's way too open of a question. And generally, if you can't figure out all the good and bad answers, how can you quantify their answer? And at the end, that's what a lot of game designers kind of, it goes off of feelings. I really felt like that was a good answer. And this guy, I didn't really feel like his answers were good. Um, and that's why you get certain designers that like candidates, while at the same, at the same time, other designers really don't like those candidates because it's all completely subjective. And what if they talk about a game you don't know? I actually had this happen to me. I've asked all these questions. And for five minutes, this person went on about an indie game I've never heard of, but they really enjoyed. And I just sat there thinking, oh God, I can't follow this at all. This is a horrible, I'm never asking this question again. Now, I tried to figure out some solutions to this and try to change this question a little bit to still get this into the question that leaves it more open for them, but also really making it more about them tearing apart systems so I can understand they understand what game systems are. But really, the only way I found to successfully figure out if the candidate understands systems is to ask about a specific system and then add or remove a mechanic from that system and see if they understand the implications of that. And that leads us to our good question about systems. You're working on the game of rock, paper, scissors. Your creative director wants you to remove one of the three options, giving the player only two options to choose from. What goes through your mind? Now, stepping through this, I started easily with rock, paper, scissors. This is something no one's going to be confused by. If you don't understand a rock, paper, scissors, or never played it, and you want to go into game design, just you're failing already. And again, your creative director wants you to remove one option. That's me removing one mechanic from that system. I want to see if you understand what that does to it. And then what goes through your mind? Generally, I don't care about the answer. I don't care about them jumping straight to something. I don't want to say, okay, solve this problem. I want to hear about their mental process. That's the main key for game design, is understanding, okay, I want, maybe if I do this, no, wait, that didn't work out. I want to hear when they fail, I want to hear when they succeed, I want to hear the steps they take. And generally, this is what goes through a game designer's mind when they hear this question. I sort of just peed on rock, paper, scissors, the holy grail of game design, and they're just completely in mass hysteria usually and completely confused. Why would you want to do this? You're a horrible creative director. But let's talk about a bad answer. Um, I actually came up with this question out of frustration midway through an interview um, because the candidate just seemed like someone who wasn't a game designer. It seemed like someone that was more of a project manager. They didn't really design systems. They brought people together to design systems. Um, so they couldn't really solve problems themselves in that way. Um, and then I really, when I came up with that, I was like, okay, this is gonna be simple. There's no way this person's not gonna be able to answer this. Everyone in the world knows what happens when you move an option, rock, paper, scissors. And this was his answer. 
I would ask why he wants to change it. This is valid to a degree. This isn't a horrible response, wanting to understand the goals of the creative director. Now I have to play the role of the creative director and say, okay, he wants it to change because he feels three options is too complex of a system and the user would be, it'd be easier for the user if there's only two options. It's a horrible answer, I know, but whatever. I don't like removing options. Uh, okay, so I'm getting a little frustrated here. I don't really care what you like. But uh, is that because you know, it's just based off your feelings and you're just a game player and you like more options? Or is that because you understand that removing an option builds a less engaging system? I'm not sure what you're getting at. I would try to convince him not to do that. Again, play the role of the creative director and I just said, okay, he's not convinced. I'd get the team together and we'd figure it out. And this was the key point in the interview where I was just like, all right, this is over. Like, it, it, you didn't understand at all what that would do to the system. You didn't think about systems at all. You're just thinking about how to manage that creative director, how to manage um, change in the game space, and then how to manage other people to bring them together to solve this problem for you. Uh, and this is another answer I haven't gotten before, <laughs> but I'd kind of be excited to get. I would remove paper, the confidence in that. <laughs> just like paper's stupid, no one likes it. But so far up to this point, even though I thought this was, sort of was a silly question that most people would be able to talk about, um, it's done a great job at separating candidates into people that understand systems and people that don't. Uh, so let's talk about some good answers. Impossible. This actually was a game designer at our studio because I felt so bad and awkward after coming up with that question thinking, okay, maybe it's such a crazy, ridiculous question. Like it's so simple that it confused him. Um, so I brought it to other game designers in our studio, which is, I just want to make that point. Test out your interview questions with other game designers. It's the easiest way to play test them and see if they actually work. That would destroy the balance of the game, of course. This is kind of the basic process that you would think of when you remove an option from rock, paper, scissors. If you remove paper, the rock would always win. I added this in here because I want to talk a little bit about the different perspectives of these answers. That would destroy the balance of the game as someone thinking about it from the system's perspective. Uh, if you remove paper, the rock would always win. As someone stepping through it as if they were the player, um, noticing that, okay, if I do that, then I do this. Um, so it's just an interesting uh, opportunity to look at different perspectives and answers. You can't do rock, paper, scissors with two options. One always wins or it's always a stalemate. Of course, that encapsulating answer. Um, but again, I ask them to kind of walk through their mental process. Um, so at this point, usually I say, okay, now what's your response to the creative director? Because that gives them a chance to take a step back. They're not just rambling their mental thoughts. They're thinking, okay, I have to compile this now into something for a superior. And this can actually lead to great answers, which it has. Um, and that great answer um, being brought to you by uh, Seinfeld. Uh, so George and Jerry were having an argument, and they played what they called in the show the choose game, uh, what I call odds and evens. And this is a two-option system. So this is a candidate that not only recognized that, okay, that destroys rock, paper, scissors, but if the creative director still wants a two-option system, I can give him a two-option system. Um, so in this game, uh, you have to pick teams. One player is odds, one player is evens. You're going you're to both throw either a one or a two out at the same time. You add up the fingers, and in this case, it's three, so odds wins. There's two opportunities for odds to win, two for evens to win. Um, and, but there's actually an extra step, which is a little bit more complexity. Now you have to select teams in this game. Or as Rock, Paper, Scissors, you don't have to select teams, but there's three options with the creative, which the creative director thought was complex. Um, so at least this is a proposal for the creative director who wants a two-option system. So again, a great answer for someone that recognizes the issues, Rock, Paper, Scissors, and then still tries to give the creative director what they're asking for. So when asking questions um, to try and see if the, the candidate understands systems or game loops, some takeaways, don't ask open questions. Um, open questions generally lead to opinions, they lead to really weird answers, and I don't think you can really determine whether or not they're good for the job um, based on those type of questions because they may go really off into weird areas that are still valid um, but don't really tell you whether they're a good game designer. Know the good and bad answers. Now, what's key here is, again, I went through all the good and bad answers and even a great answer here, and that allows me to quantify their answer. Um, if it's too open, I can't figure out if it's a good answer or a bad answer, really. Um, it's just based off feelings. On top of that, if I know all the good and bad answers, I can give that to a recruiter, and they can do a lot of the work for me, um, kind of screening these people before it gets to me. And if you maybe have noticed at your studios, generally recruiters will ask for questions, and it's actually very hard to do because they don't understand game design, they don't understand how to judge open questions and these open answers, um, so it's not something they can do easily. So finally, uh, to test systems, add or remove a mechanic from a known system and then see if they understand those implications. So this is kind of my great way of understanding how to test systems and game loops, but we still have two other skills, which is problem solving and player experience. 
up next. Um, and I generally like to use real world problems. I wanna see them step through something they might be stepping through on the job. First, of course, bad question. You need to design a new MPC for a game, where do you start? I've actually seen this question asked and I sort of cringed uh, because I don't know even what they're looking for. Is this a, a process question? Are they asking to solve a problem somehow? Where do I start? I start with understanding the game and then the NPCs that are currently in the game and how I can challenge the player outside of what you're already challenging. Um, but what this question feels like it's saying is just design, go. Design something, um, which is very difficult to answer. And again, it's one of those open questions that's just, I wanna hear you talk and, and see where you go with this. Now, a great answer for this question isn't going through your process. That's kind of a boring answer no one's gonna really pay attention to. A great answer to this question is going back into your experiences and talking about when you design an MPC, why you designed it that way, what process you went through. That's actually what they're looking for. It's not what they're asking. Great interviewers will give that to them. Poor interviewers won't, they'll just be confused. And a good question. If you're looking to figure out how they design an MPC, if you're looking to figure out what their process actually is, don't ask them what their process is ask them, uh, give them a scenario, and try and have them step it through that scenario. So this is a good question. You're working on Far Cry, and the creative director asks you to design a tank vehicle as an enemy encounter. Two points to keep in mind while designing this. One, Far Cry is an open world game, and the creative director wants us to be a roaming NPC that can be encountered anywhere. Two, Far Cry supports a wide variety of play styles from the stealth archer to the demolition man. All play styles should be able to overcome this tank encounter. What's the first thing that crosses your mind when given this task? It's a loaded question, obviously, and something I give more to mid to senior level designers, um, but stepping through it, starting with Far Cry, uh, a huge franchise for Ubisoft, and if you haven't played it, you shouldn't be interviewing for game design at Ubisoft. It's that simple, and I want to stress that for anyone that's looking to interview in this room. I've interviewed a lot of people, oh, I haven't played Far Cry, sorry. You shouldn't be here. You're asking to take the keys of that franchise and be on the game design team. How can you do that if you don't know the game? Uh, second point is I'm asking them to design a tank vehicle. I'm not asking them to design a dragon for a drug sequence in Far Cry. That's really complex. And now again, I don't care about their answers. I don't care about their ideas for designing dragons. I wanted to keep it very simple um, because what's really important is these two problems that I laid out. Far Cry is an open world game. We want this to be an open world encounter, which means we don't want this to be an arena encounter, which we've all seen those where you walk into an arena, there's RPGs scattered everywhere and you're like, okay, something's about to go down. Um, that's not the type of encounter we're looking for. We want something that is just roaming the world freely with systemic rules. Far Cry supports a wide variety of play styles. Um, so what are all the play styles? How can you solve that? And what's the first thing that crosses your mind? Again, I want to hear their mental process. But more importantly, I'm trying to turn this interview into a design session. Um, interviews generally test interview skills. Design sessions are going to test their job skills. And the more comfortable they can be in that design session, the better. So let's step through some bad answers. I love doing that. Uh, skipping the encounter. I've had can a candidate that actually once said, okay, okay, design a tank encounter. Okay, so you destroy one tank, and you know what, to make it difficult, we'll, we'll add two tanks. And I was just blown away, like you just passed everything. I, this candidate did not understand what really game design was and what the meat of their job really was gonna be. Tangents that dodge the question. Um, so I had a candidate as well go through, oh, I would love to steal a tank and drive the tank, and for five minutes wouldn't stop talking about driving the tank, which completely wasn't this question about a tank vehicle as an enemy. Too much reference. And reference is good, generally, but if you never bring it back to solve the problem, there's no purpose to it. If you talk about uh, which one candidate did just battlefield tanks for the next five minutes, um, it didn't really help out in, in solving this problem, and I kept trying to bring him back to the problem he was trying to solve and they don't understand the problems. Again, I laid out those two problems, and the whole point of the question is, do you understand what issues will come if, if you get those problems and try to design a tank with those in mind? And that leads us to our good answers. The first one being the open world problem, uh, which again, it's not an arena. This is now something that's roaming the world, um, that it has systemic rules, which generally means the player needs to bring the solution. Um, these aren't solutions that are scattered everywhere. Now you could scatter the solution all over the entire world, um, but that may cause its own problems. And then play styles. So this is a chance for the, the, the designer to try and think of, okay, what are all the different player types that existed in that game that I played, hopefully? Um, and then what challenges and opportunities can be used to overcome the tank in those different player styles? If I have just a bow and arrow, how can I take out this tank? And this starts to get a little bit dangerously into idea generation. So it's your job as the interviewer to say, okay, what other problems might that idea create that you just mentioned? You gotta keep bringing it back to problems to solve. You wanna see, as I said earlier, 
if they have an idea in their head, can they, make, can they judge, okay, what, what does that do to the mechanic? What does that do to the system? What does that do to the overall game? Can they own that process? Um, and this is, an idea, this is an opportunity for you to bring bad ideas to the table, ideas you know have holes in them to see if they can detect those holes. And most importantly, combined, uh, problem one and two actually create a major problem for stealthier players. People have to bring their own solution, and then also um, they have to somehow overcome this tank as a stealth player. And that leads us to a great answer. So this was actually a candidate that was sort of failing at this question. Um, I was trying to turn it into a design session. He was fumbling around, didn't really understand, until finally at one point his nerves went away, and he just sort of felt good in that design session type mentality and started riffing really well, um, and talked about Splinter Cell. Uh, mentioned, uh, we, we, have the, we had this thing in Splinter Cell that uh, NPCs are generally walking around with weapons the entire game, and they can get kind of monotonous. Uh, the NPCs don't really feel like real characters if that's all they're doing. Um, so there was a couple things added where sometimes an NPC would have his gun far away from him on a table, against, leaning up against a wall, taking a smoke break, or he's talking to another NPC. And if you startled that NPC, they'd freak out and try and rush towards that gun, giving you more opportunity to try and take that NPC down. But it also added a lot more narrative into the world and made these characters feel more real. He utilized this and turned it into something the tank could do. That's roaming the world, the two guys get out of the tank, have a smoke break. This gives an opportunity for that stealth player to take those guys out or an opportunity for you to steal the tank. Now, again, this is tough between is this a cool mechanic system that could be used throughout the game? Is this, an, is this a cool idea? But it didn't really matter because in that design session, what this did was provide a revelation that it's not a tank, it's two guys in a tank. And for a stealth mechanic, that's huge. Because in stealth games, what you're usually doing is manipulating these NPCs, and it's hard to manipulate a faceless tank, but if you know there's two guys in that tank, now you're thinking, okay, how can I get those two guys out of that tank? Can I smoke them out? What else can I do? And that really made the design session start to come alive. Um, and that made me think, okay, day to day, I could talk with this guy. I could have a cool design session with him, and we could solve problems together. So um, again, to solve problems, uh, so some takeaway for problem solving and player experience. Uh, don't ask how they design, offer scenarios with problems. Um, generally, uh, what you're really asking when you ask them how they design is, hey, how do you solve problems? And I don't know how to ask that or even answer that, to be honest. If you ask someone how they solve problems, don't be surprised when they say, oh, I think about it, and then solutions come up. Um, it's a very confusing, weird question and a weird answer. Turn the interview into a design session. It allows you to test their job skills instead of testing their interview skills, which I kind of mentioned before. And then finally, keep the conversation on track. Um, you want it to be about solving problems. So you want to see, again, you want to see if they can take that idea and say, okay, how does that affect the mechanic? How does that affect the system? Work it up through that process. That's what game designers own. So as we kind of recap, um, I, I kind of successfully with those two questions talked about how to get those skills, uh, those four skills I'm looking for out of the interview process. And those bad questions I talked about how to stay away from the idea generation, design critiquing, those type of things you're not looking for. Um, generally, rock, paper, scissors, a great question for junior designers. The tank question, again, more mid to senior level designers. Uh, but what about game directors? And I wanted to throw this in here to step through this process again, just to get it ingrained in your head. Um, the first thing we start with is what skills are we looking for? Uh, so high level direction and the ability to build brands and understand brand values. And if we take that further and start talking about a bad question, which many of you may have heard, where would you take the next Far Cry? Um, so this again, hopefully by now you can see this question and go, oh, this is too open. All it's really saying is, hey, you got any cool ideas? Don't be surprised if you ask this question when the person says, oh, Far Cry could be in space, and then talks about space for the next 10 minutes, and all you're doing is sitting there thinking, why did I ask this question? I don't care about this idea. A good question. Critics are saying that many Ubisoft franchises like Assassin's Creed and Far Cry are becoming too similar of experiences. What's the root of this criticism? How are these brands different? And how would you help differentiate these brands in future installments? I'm gonna put these questions side by side because it completely represents kind of the point I'm getting at right now. Too many people ask the question on the left, not enough people ask the question on the right. And it's not about amount of text. With the question on the left, you're gonna get very open answers that are gonna be all about idea generation. Is this person good for the job? I have no idea. Do they have bad ideas? Yeah, so does everyone else. Um, on the question on the right, you're gonna get at the root, which is here's a problem to solve that we actually have in, in the world right now. 
Um, and also, do you understand the brand values of Far Cry and Assassin's Creed? Do you understand the things that makes them different? Obviously at Ubisoft, we have a lot of Ubisoft values we try and put in all of our games, which start to make some of the games overlap in terms of open world great experiences, um, but what makes each of these franchises also different? And how can you build on those differences to separate these brands in the future? So hopefully uh, you guys will start noticing as you ask questions, as you listen to questions, um, where they're gonna go, where they, where they probably shouldn't go. Uh, so, just a final thoughts on where we go from here. Uh, so for interviewers, define game design. It's sort of the first step of your job is to figure out, okay, what are the skills I'm looking for? What does it mean for my studio? Again, it may be something more technical in your studio, which you wanna add technical questions. You may merge game design with level design at your studio, which you wanna include those skills as well. Build direction, or build direct questions, sorry, for um, that definition that you, that you laid out. And then know the good and bad answers um, for those questions so that you can maybe even give them to recruiters so that you can understand and quantify those answers. Turn interviews into design sessions because again, you're trying to test job skills, you're not testing interviewing skills. And you can actually get people to uh, ease in a little better because um, generally people get nervous around interviewing. People don't get nervous that are designers in design sessions, they feel a lot more comfortable. Keep reviewing your hiring process. Um, this is extremely important, and this isn't like something to do annually. Every time you ask a question and you get a bad answer, wonder if that was a bad question. Um, really judge yourself and start testing questions on each other. Um, if someone says something poor in an interview, if they're going in for the next interview, talk to that person who's gonna be interviewing them um, and really figure out, okay, this was bad. See if you can probe there a little further. See if maybe it was a bad question or maybe um, he just didn't understand. Raising the, uh, to me, this raises the bar for the entire industry. Um, if we can raise the bar for our game designers, if we can raise the bar overall, um, our industry will improve. And um, I just wanted to add a section for candidates as well. Um, there's a lot of people I know that want to be game designers. A majority of those people don't understand what game design is. Uh, and, and so my first step usually is to try and scare them away from being game designers and see if they can handle that. Um, so a couple of things to keep in mind. If you all want to go into game design or if you're looking for another job, uh, game design is a profession. Um, too many people treat it like a hobby. And what I mean by that is too many people are turning their nose up at indie games because they like ma major games or at mass market games because, oh, that's the eighth iteration. Oh, it's all the same. I like, I'm an indie game person. Um, this isn't a hobby. This is a profession. So you want to play everything, reference anything. And I tell my game designers, if it's 90 plus, you've played it. If it's 80 plus and in your genre, you've played it. Everything else is, in, is your hobby. You can do whatever you want with that time. But you got to really start taking this seriously. Game design is tedious. Uh, you're designing a world. You have to really fill all the holes in that world to make sure they're designed before it goes into production or you're gonna waste a lot of time. Um, for more information on this, Liz England actually has an amazing blog post called The Door Problem. Really goes at the tediousness of what your job is actually gonna be and hopefully it will scare people away from wanting to be game designers. Uh, think out loud. Your mental process is the main important thing we're after. I don't want you to flounder around on top too much not knowing where to go. I don't want you to go straight to the answer because I don't care about the answer. I'm not going to use that answer. I want to hear your thought process and where you go in terms of, oh, that, this system that works here, that doesn't work here. Okay, maybe that fails. I want to see where I can take this. Um, that's the main key. Um, not only is that going to help you in interviews, it's going to help you in design sessions. It's going to help you pitch your design systems to the team um, because you can say, okay, here are my goals. Here are the problems I was trying to solve. Um, here's some ideas I had that didn't work and here's why I went to this one. And generally that's going to get people on board more often. Game design isn't about your ideas, it's about everyone else's, and I can't preach that enough. Um, the entire dev team is a group of passionate people that will have ideas, and I usually say ideas are like Legos in a sea of Legos, and too many game designers are picking up a Lego and going, look, this one's mine, and there's Legos everywhere, who cares? Nobody cares that that's yours. Your job is to build something out of all those Legos. That's the key. Understand which ideas work, which ideas don't work, and then build the experience you're trying to build. That's my talk. Um, this is my contact information. I usually throw it up. People tell me not to, but whatever. Um, I love to keep the conversation going, uh, both on the interviewer side, on the candidate side, if you guys have any other thoughts. Also, uh, two years ago, I did a talk called Designing Your Design Team. Um, it's on the GDC vault. Please check this out on the GDC vault after as well. Uh, and if you look at those and have any other thoughts on either of those, I'd love to hear it. So please, let's keep this going. Also, after this, uh, probably out of time, so I'm going to go to the wrap-up room if you guys have any other questions. Thank you.